All right, talking about the male and female reproductive organs, which despite your lifestyle choices, we're all built to make babies, to make offspring. And when I say lifestyle choices, some people choose not to make babies, not to, not to reproduce, but we're always you know, born with the capability, at least hopefully anyway, sometimes there's some, some difficulties there, but we're built to be able to, to reproduce. And so let's fill in the other blanks. All right, sexual reproduction is the process by which organisms produce offspring by making germ cells called gametes. A okay, germ cells, um, kind of a fancy word there, not, not germs like bacteria, viruses, okay? But it refers to our gametes. Gametes are our sex cells. So in men, it's sperm, and in females, it's eggs, okay? And when those two unite, that process is called fertilization, which means the sperm has burrowed its way inside of the egg, which forms into what we call a zygote. And this is a single cell that we all begin our life at. And, and that cell then becomes two cells, which becomes four cells and on and on and on and on and on. Okay. Now, as far as males and females goes, uh, go, we have anatomically distinct organs adapted for producing those gametes for facilitating the fertilization process. But in females, they have the expanded role of sustaining the growth of the embryo and fetus. If you think about um, a guy's job, it's just to produce the sperm and then release the sperm. And then truly the job is done. Hopefully, you know, the male puts in a little more effort than that, taking care of the baby. But females, you know, they have to grow the baby inside of their womb, then they have to give birth, obviously is a tremendously crazy thing. And then if they choose to, breastfeeding um, is a, another thing that females um, do and that can last for a long, long time. And so we'll also talk about, um, aside from what's listed here on this page, the uh, mammary glands and the, the female breasts at the end of the lecture. Now, the reproductive systems of both males and females can be broken down into kind of three major types of organs, the primary sex organs, the accessory reproductive organs, and then supporting structures. Despite what you might think, the primary sex organs in men and women are not the penis and the vagina, okay? The primary sex organs, which also are called the gonads, are what produce the gametes, the sperm and the eggs. We've talked about these before though, and that's because they release hormones. Okay. In men, we're talking about the testes, producing hormones like testosterone. And in females, we're talking about the ovaries, which produce hormones like estrogens, progesterone, and so on and so on. Okay. So we have talked about those before, not very great in detail, but we did mention them back when we talked about the endocrine system. The accessory reproductive organs are going to contain or uh, excuse me, produce the substances that protect the gametes and facilitate their movement. They include ducts that store and transport the gametes. Um, in females, you can think of like uh, the fallopian tubes um, or oviducts, as they're also known as. And men can talk about like um, the vas deferens. Um, and then you got glands that produce substances that protect the gametes and facilitate their movement. Several glands are located in the, the female reproductive system and men. Um, that includes like the prostate gland that I mentioned at the end of our last lecture. And then finally, um, now we get to talk about the penis, which is a supporting structure, um, assisting the delivery of gametes or providing a site for the growth of the embryo and the fetus during pregnancy. Obviously the penis is a male structure, whereas the uterus is the female structure, which um, will also be known as the womb. Okay. Gynecology is the specialized branch of medicine concerned with diagnosing and treating diseases of the female reproductive system. 
whereas andrology is a branch of medicine that deals with male disorders, especially infertility and sexual dysfunction. Uh, doctor known as a urologist can also diagnose and treat diseases and disorders of the male reproductive system. All right, like I said, we're gonna kind of split this lecture into two parts beginning on this page. We'll start the first part, which is the part where we talk about the male reproductive system and our structures. We aren't gonna get through the entirety of this, obviously, but we'll at least, like I said, dip our toes into it, finish that up next week, and then move on into the female reproductive structures. All right, let's start by talking about those primary male sex organs, the testes or testicles, as they're also known as. A pair of oval glands, which are the site of sperm production and a process called spermatogenesis. If you break down that word spermatogenesis, it's a big word. It begins with literally the word sperm at the front end and ends with genesis. So what this translates to mean is sperm formation. And that's Sperm genesis means formation, and that's what's taking place here. And um, they are also the only male reproductive organs with endocrine functions, creating testosterone. I just mentioned on the previous page. Um, I've talked about this before, but you probably have forgotten. Um, if you haven't, good for you. Um, but they actually develop up in the abdomen, so up in the abdominal pelvic cavity, but then descend down into the scrotum through those inguinal canals. And if you think back to our lecture, let me just show you when we talked about muscle, we learned that the superficial inguinal uh, ring was the opening that leads to that canal. And it's essentially just a hole in your ab muscles, okay? This canal is what the testes travel through on their way down from the pelvic cavity into the scrotum, okay? Unfortunately, that's not always what happens, okay? There are period, or there are times where that does not happen. We call this cryptocortism, which is just failure of one or both testes to descend. Typically that leads to sterility and would increase their chances of testicular cancer. Okay. One of the first things, I mean, it's not the very first thing, obviously, you like cut the cord and whatnot, clean the baby up, make sure it's breathing and um, give it to mom. But, you know, within the first few hours, um, a nurse or a doctor will check. And I know this because I have two boys and I was in um, the delivery room. And a few hours later, a nurse came by and they checked both of my sons and uh, made sure that the, the testes had descended down. Surrounding each testis, we have a tunica vaginalis, which doesn't sound like it belongs around um, the testis. Sounds like it would be a female structure, but it is uh, derived from the peritoneum and is what forms during the descent of the testes. A collection of serous fluid in the tunica vaginalis is called a hydrocele, which can occur due to injury of the testes or injury to the epididymis. A looking here at the bottom of the page, uh, we can see the tunica vaginalis labeled here in our saturn section. And uh, just like the, uh, the peritoneum, what we talked about the other day, it has two layers, a parietal and a visceral layer. And um, that's found here because this is what forms when the testes come down. And uh, the tunica vaginalis, as I just mentioned, um, is derived from the peritoneum. Okay. The tunica albuginea is a dense white fibrous capsule that's internal to that vaginalis, and its job is to encase each testis, but it also enters each gland and produces septa or septum, which is the singular form of that, 
um, dividing it into cone-shaped lobules. And we can see that very nicely right here, okay? The tunica albuginea surrounding each testis, but kind of more importantly, these little finger-like extensions, each of which is called a septum, creates these little compartments. Each compartment is called a lobule, and that's very similar to what we've seen several different times here the last few weeks. For example, we saw lymph nodes um, with trabeculae passing internally. We saw the thymus, kind of the same thing. Um, but those create these little lobules. And inside of each of those lobules are very important structures called seminiferous tubules. Okay? A series of one to three tightly coiled tubules found in each lobule. And I would highlight this because it's very important. This is where spermatogenesis actually takes place. So these tightly coiled tubes are where the sperm are produced. Okay? And uh, the cells that actually do the formation of the sperm are called spermatogenic cells, which makes sense, their name, because they perform spermatogenesis. We call them spermatogenic cells. Okay? Also located within these seminiferous tubules are sertoli, which also go by sustentacular or nurse cells, which have several functions in supporting spermatogenesis. I'm not really getting into that. And then also they're not located in the seminiferous tubules, but they're located between them, are Leydig or interstitial cells, which secrete that testosterone that I've mentioned. Okay. Now the sperm that are made here will not stay there for very long but will instead travel out from the seminiferous tubules to this kind of, it looks like a capillary network called a Rethi testis, but they get there by way of these short little ducts, each of which is called a straight tubule. And I guess they call them straight tubules because they are straight, especially when you compare them to the seminiferous tubules. Okay, so the sperm come from the seminiferous tubules through the straight tubules to the Rethi testis, and then from there, the sperm will travel to what's called the epididymis, where we store our sperm. They get from the reti testis to those parts of the epididymis by way of efferent ducts or efferent ductules, as you see there labeled there. Okay. And so I've already kind of read through all that or explained all this, but the efferent ducts are 12 small efferent ductules that arise from the reti testis and carry the sperm to the epididymis. The epididymis, although it looks like it's just part of a testy, it's kind of a separate structure. It's also enclosed within the scrotum. Um, but this is, and I would highlight this, the site of sperm maturation and storage. So this is where we're going to hold and store the sperm and allow them to mature. This maturation process takes about two weeks and essentially just enables the, the, the sperm to grow their tail so that they um, increase their motility, their ability to swim. Okay. Now there's kind of some different parts to each of our um, epididymises. The tightly coiled region is known as the ductus epididymis. Okay. Um, it also consists of a superior portion known as the head, a narrow midpoint known as the body, and a smaller inferior portion known as the tail. You can see the head, the body, the duct or ductus of epididymis, and uh, the tail down here at the bottom very nicely. Okay. From there, the sperm will be ejaculated out and into the ductus or vas deferens, which is a muscular tube that serves to deliver the sperm to our seminal vesicle. Okay. Each of these two ducts has a very narrow lumen and is well innervated by sympathetic fibers. Each of these is about 45 centimeters or 18 inches in length, which if you think about it, the testes are not 18 inches away from the penis, which means and should really open your eyes to the fact that sperm are not delivered directly to the penis. And uh, let me just jump ahead to really show you what's taking place. Okay. The sperm come up using this ductus or vas deferens. They go through that inguinal canal that we talked about just a second ago. They go up and around the bladder and then they twist and turn right back down as they then eventually will drain into the urethra. So it's not at all a direct shot from the testes to the penis. It's a very indirect route. And okay? this ductus or vas deferens is the structure that gets that set of sperm to the uh, 
the seminal vesicles, which we'll get into that not today, though, because we're running short on time. You've probably heard of a procedure that a man can have done if they no longer want to have a baby again, described as being what's called a vasectomy. They call it a vasectomy because this structure, the vas deferens, is what's actually, as they say, snipped. Okay? Um, but um, that's a fairly common procedure. Okay? Uh, there are, um, or there is one special region within the, the vas deferens that has a kind of a different name. It's um, dilated terminal portion just before reaching um, the seminal vesicle is called the, the ampulla of the ductus deferens. You'll see that later in the lecture. Okay? Now, sperm are also stored here until peristaltic contractions of the smooth muscle surrounding it forces sperm forward during ejaculation. But as far as sperm storage, most of it takes place once again in the epididymis. Okay. Now that vas deferens or ductus deferens is gonna ascend out of the testi and into what's called the spermatic cord. Spermatic cord you can see here in our two pictures on the right. It's just a supporting structure sending out of the scrotum through that inguinal canal. Not only does it consist of the vas deferens, but there's also testicular arteries, veins, autonomic nerves, lymphatic vessels, a muscle called the cremaster muscle that we'll talk about later in the lecture. Um, and so it's just got a whole host of other, uh, all sorts of stuff. And its job is just to connect each testis to our internal body cavity. As far as the images on this page go, I do want you to know this one on the left side of the page. Um, I would say pretty much everything with the exception of blood vessels and nerves would be fair game. So make sure you know it, which is a sagittal section where the, the test has been cut in half from front to back. All right, we'll stop here. We'll pick up with the scrotum and other parts of the male reproductive system on Tuesday when I see you all again.